Hey, thanks so much for taking the time to find out what God is doing here at Life Church. We are so excited as we're in our Miracle May, our Vision Month, talking about what God is doing right now and articulating our mission and vision for the future about what we see God doing here in England and in Europe. And that's why we're so grateful that you're taking time to join with us. We pray as you watch this, as you listen, however it is that you're plugging in today, that you're really inspired about what God can do through people who are fully committed to serve Him. Let's get this started. In this Miracle May, this Miracle Month, our Vision Month, I wanted to just have a different service today, a different approach. And so we're going to receive our offering this morning in about 15 or 20 minutes. But first, I wanted to talk about giving. I wanted to designate this service to talk about one of the most important aspects of God, because God is a giver. And I am so grateful for God's generosity, for his kindness to all of us, for his decision to keep giving and keep increasing in our worlds. And so I wanted to frame this day and talk about this in two aspects. I'm going to talk about understanding tithing and understanding offering. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to the Bible a lot this morning because the Bible is our source. It's our manual. It's our everything for life. So we're not teaching today about tithing and offering to try to get more money out of you. We're trying to bring the truth of God's Word so that God's Word can get things to you from heaven and into your care. And that you would understand that everything you currently have, you're a steward of. You're a steward of your life. You're a steward of your relationships. You're a steward of your situation that you're into. And because of that, as you grow in your understanding, God can trust you with increase. And so we're going to anchor this in this principle that is so important. Because I wanted to call this first. That's it. Everybody say first. Talk about first. I want to talk about priority. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, as we get started. And as you're turning to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, let me say this, that last week I introduced this concept of vision, about putting strength into us, how vision gets courage into your soul and clarity into your soul and makes you consistent. That's what vision does. And so consistency is so important for all of us. Consistency is not what we see in society today. What we see is fear. People are in fear for where the economy is going to go with Brexit and the proposed collapse again. We look at the politicians and the, the confusion in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party and the politicians do not know what to do. You read the news and the Bank of England does not know what to do as they begin to panic about inflation. Here in the north of England, it should be the northern powerhouse. We know that marriages are being destroyed because of a lack of understanding of finances. Husband and wives arguing about bills and about tensions and all kinds of struggles that they have because of the debt. A younger generation worried about when will they be able to have enough money to buy their first home or buy their first vehicle or, oh my Lord Jesus, pay for driving car insurance, which costs an absolute fortune these days. And so increasingly, people are borrowing against their future, borrowing more money from credit cards that they can't repay, getting into all kinds of debt and deficit and struggling, and all this is going on in our environment. And God has a lot to say to bring His wisdom into the situation. And that's why I'm talking about first. Because when we see the confusion in society, God teaches us that as Christians, although we will not be immune from the challenges that people face, God wants to use you and I to have clarity so we can help other people understand that our God is a good God. And our God has a great future for our families and for every single one of us. Our God is an awesome God. We don't need to fear the future. Our God is going to create a great future for every one of us. So as I read 
in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, this was one of the first commitments I made when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And yet the simplicity of it has stayed with me all of these years. It's a familiar scripture to many of us. But sometimes the familiar things are the deepest things that we always need to remember. So here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I don't know why I'm turning to it because I have it memorized, but I'm doing it anyways. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When you seek first, seeking first is the antidote to worry. There, I said it. If you seek him first, you will not fear tomorrow because you've already sought God and you have a peace that permeates your future. When you seek God, God starts to speak to you about your destiny. He starts to speak to you about the future that we could create here in this region called the Shire. We can do so much when you understand this principle of seeking. Instead of worrying about some of the pressures we have in society today, you look at our overcrowded prisons, you look at the bread lines, you look at the people that are worrying about rising unemployment rates, all that out there, I take into the throne room of God and I say, Lord, could somehow, could you use our church to be part of the answer? Lord, could we be part of healing people that were coming out of prison and, and now they could find jobs and find employment? God, could you help us take people who were lonely, who spent years in their careers trying to earn finance and help them understand how they can make a difference with their lives There will be a legacy that goes long after they are gone, a legacy that lasts longer than money in the bank. Because when you go to heaven, guess what? Newsflash. You can't take it with you. When we get to heaven, I don't know what your perspective is, but we're not going to need finance when we get to heaven because the streets are already paved with gold. Provision is the day that we'll walk into when we get to eternity. But on the earth, here on the earth, to bring God's provision by seeking Him first is one of the devil's greatest things he loves to confuse people about. You look at our society today and cynicism, people who criticize the minute someone starts to teach about finance. Why? Because they think that people are trying to manipulate and control. You know what, people? People of God, we're not trying to manipulate and control anything this morning. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to give you some scriptures, and you can think about what it is I want you to, to think and pray about, free from manipulation, free from anybody arm-twisting you or bringing you into some kind of thing, telling you what to do. No, we believe the Spirit of God is real. We believe the Spirit of God who is, lives in all of us, He can speak to you about what you should give because next week we're going to take up our financial offering. But before we do that, I wanted to talk about this concept because it will help us understand what God says about finances. Amen? Amen? Amen. Thanks so much, Sam. Come on, give it up for Sam on the keys, who is always just so in tune and anointed in our house. So this principle of first, so important, because God's heart of generosity is revealed because Jesus, whom God sent, talked about finances and generosity 16 out of the 28 parables he shared about. Somebody say, wow, I think Jesus is trying to tell us something. Over 500 times, the Bible talks about prayer. 500 times, the Bible talks about faith. But over 2,000 times, the Bible talks about finance and possessions. Why? Because it's so important that possessions and the things that you own don't have you. 
but you have them. The responsibilities that you steward shouldn't control you. No, 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 no. You're much deeper as an individual than that. There's been occasions when families have had a house burned down and they've lost everything. They've lost their home, they've lost their possessions, and yet they still have the capacity within them to move further and to invent and create again. You see, the possessions that we have, they might reflect our likes and our dislikes, but they don't own us, we own them. It's so important that we understand this principle of what it means. And so God, in talking about First, he talks about this concept, this word called tithing. Tithing is not a word that you'll be taught about in our educational system growing up in the UK, but I wish it was standard curriculum to go along with mathematics. I wish you, earned, you, you, know, you learned addition, subtraction, multiplication, and tithing. Because tithing would just help our schools out so much. We learn all these complex ways to use geometry and measure angles, but we forget about the most foundational aspects of our society. If we teach how to balance our checkbooks before we understand our geometry, I know checkbooks is an old fashioned term that many people don't even understand, but I still think like that. I still think about balancing up what you earn with what you spend so that you can decide to make a greater difference. It's just that simple. And so tithe, the word tithe literally means 10%. That's all it means, 10%. But in the Jewish mindset, 10% of the tithe, this literal term, was so embedded in the culture that literally the children of the day, they grew up learning about the tithe that we don't, we don't talk about today. And so in going into the Bible, I know this might be old school for some of you, but I think it's important to be clear so that we can be moving forward, not on our opinion, but on what God's word really says. So this principle of first I'm introducing because I believe that scriptures like Matthew 23, 23, Luke 11, 42, Luke 18, 12, those scriptures are Jesus talking about the tithe. People say, oh, Jesus didn't talk about the tithe. He did talk about the tithe. He grew up in a culture where he taught in synagogue where pretty much everyone already understood the tithe, but he did refer to it. I want to focus on some different aspects of this. I don't want to go into what Jesus said. I want to start more in the beginning of what Jesus taught. But before I do that, let's just remember that John 3.16, that God gave Jesus to the world. I mean, that's God's nature. God's a giver. He gave everything. And when he gave Jesus to us, it wasn't so that we can just get our account books out and go, okay, I'll give God 10%, ticket off the list. That's all I'll give him. No, Jesus gave his life. He purchased us in another place in the Bible it talks about. He purchased us with his blood. So we belong to Jesus. Every aspect of us, if we're saved and we're born again, we belong to Jesus. That's great news for anybody who has ever sinned. Because that means all of your sins have been forgiven. And now you have a brand new, clean, fresh start. Not because of you, not because of what you did, not because of what you earned, but because of what Jesus gave up for you. That's why God gave his son, so that we could all be free. So having established that, let me go to the last book of the Old Testament, the book that sets up Jesus in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Just turn to the book of Matthew, turn left, and you'll find it. Malachi chapter 3. Here we, have, well, here we have God focusing on not just tithes, but also on this other word, offerings. So the tithe, the 10%, that's the minimum. That's the minimum that's required from God's people. But the offering, that's whatever else you want to add to your tithe. That's 10%. Plus. And the offering has no specification, no qualification, no numerical amount attached to it. In other words, you decide what your offering is. And so in Malachi chapter 3, when it talks about this concept of tithing and offering, it goes on to say this. Verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. 
and see if I will not throw. Not just open, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not be able to contain it and I will prevent pests from devouring your crop. Yeah, I mean, you gotta understand, this is like, wow, this is a revelation. When I first read these words, I had no idea about biblical economics. I had watched my father live in poverty his whole life, start off as a dishwasher, and then end up buying a business, getting all of these assets, buying them all together, getting 200 staff, but yet never understanding the power of tithes and offerings, always living in fear, always living in overdrawn, even though he had a business, he was never able to adjust so that he could, he, could, he could actually spend less than he was earning. He never really accounted for that. Now, the beauty of what God is teaching us is, if you have to add up your 10%, then you actually have to understand everything you earn, everything in this economy, in this, in this world, in the UK culture, and it's different for other people listening in other nations, but, but in this culture, it means we have to understand what our national insurance tax is and our, our P-A-Y-E and all those different things. We have to understand what those things are. And, and I know what it's like. As soon as you start to dig into the detail of all that, it can be overwhelming when you ask questions because you think everyone knows the answers. The truth is, so many people do not know what those simple things are, and they're not even asking the question. We want to grow a, a, a culture where it's okay to ask questions. We just want to have a culture that is not okay to be cynical. Being cynical and negative and always assuming the worst is not the way we should do life. So if someone com comes into our car park on a Sunday and maybe they've not been to church very much and so, and so maybe they pull into church in a car that maybe most people in church haven't seen very much of, like an Aston Martin. And they pull into church with the Aston Martin and on the way in, the car park person says, oh my Lord, that person must have cheated somebody because they're driving in in an Aston Martin. Now I know no one says that in our car park team, nobody ever said that. And when they come into the car park, somebody else is like, oh man, did you see that car? Wow, they must have really cheated on their taxes this year. Do you able to afford a car like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never saw an Aston Martin. I've been working for 50 years. I never even stepped foot in an Aston Martin. And you get this, cult. it's like, I think those things God sends us as a test. Instead of saying, hey, that person is my brother in Christ. And if he's my brother, he owes me a ride in his brand new Aston Martin. That's a different approach. I bet you he'd take me for a spin around the neighborhood. In fact, I think I'm gonna invite myself over to lunch. And he's gonna drop me back home today and wave and say, hey, look at my new friend. And then maybe in the car you say, how did you have the business disciplines to be able to afford this Aston Martin? Can you mentor me, help me, teach me? And it breaks a barrier in your life as you start to not be negative and cynical. No, you start to not just assume the worst and jump to conclusions. And, and so all this stuff that gets into our mind, it just robs us of the truth of God's word. You see, could it be that you gave five pounds or 10 pounds in the offering last week and you said, God, that's my little bit. I'm bringing it into the kingdom. And then God sends somebody in an Aston Martin and maybe you should get in their car, or maybe it's a BMW, or maybe it's a Jag. Maybe that person is sent to help get you a pay rise in the future. Maybe God sent somebody, and you're like, help me understand my future, and while you're rejecting it, they're ready to teach you business principles that it's gonna help you break generations of debt that go back two and three generations. You see, God is so practical, he does it every week, and that's why the Bible says this. This is the only place and the entire word of God, that God allows us to test him. God doesn't just encourage it, he commands it. He says, test me in this and see if I will not, not just open, if I will not throw open. Woo. So we're like, well, it's sacrilegious to test God. No, it's not, it's biblical. What that means is when you figure out your 10%, your whole tithe, you test God. You right now, you might be have a job and might earn you 400 pounds a month. Hey, bring it in to test God. You bring your 40 pounds and say, God, I'm testing you. 
Lord, I believe I should have a pay rise. I believe I should have a promotion. And you start testing God. You start saying, okay, God, it's up to you. I mean, this test is so valuable for all of us. Do you think Moses knew how God was going to deliver him out of Israel? He didn't have a map. He didn't have a plan. He just had simple obedience. And in his simple obedience, God said simply this, Moses, I want you to go. I don't want you to plunder the Egyptians. And that's the word that says in the Bible. I want you to go back. I don't want you to get the gold. And I want you to get the silver and take it. So that's what he did. And he ended up leaving Egypt with whole wagons full of gold and wealth because that's the kind of God that we serve. He didn't have a plan. You can't load wagons up with all that and escape the Egyptian army. But God opened the Red Sea. I mean, he didn't know it was coming. It was a miracle. Guess what? God's about to open some Red Seas for some of you in this house this morning. He's going to open some Red Seas. You didn't see them coming, but God is already now preparing the relationships for you. Why? Because you're bringing the 10%. Now, I know some people say, Steve, I've been tithing for years, and I've not seen some of the breakthroughs. Well, this is why I want to really dig in and teach some Bible to you because I want to teach the principle I've wanted to teach to the church for years. And what I want to teach is about first fruits. We'll talk about first fruits. First fruits are so important that we understand what the first fruits are. Now, let me just demonstrate it for you and then I'll, I'll bring the Bible to you. The first fruits are simply this, bread. Say we go to work and we earn finance. And the finance that we represent is represented by this loaf of bread that we have. This is our income. This is 100% of our income. So this income, if I break it into sections, would probably demonstrate the different things that we spend. So here's our mortgage. Here's our, you know, we can break all these different piece, pieces off and we represent how we divide up our monthly income. But what God tells us to do in the tithe is not just to bring any 10%. God's asking us to bring the first 10%. So we've earned the whole loaf, we've earned the bread, but now God is asking us for the first 10% and we bring that in to the house of God. Let me show you that in scripture because in Proverbs chapter three, verse nine, Proverbs 3, verse 9 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your bars will be filled to overflowing. Proverbs chapter 3. Now this principle was in Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, we see two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, they both brought their offerings to the Lord. But the difference between their offerings was massive. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, we see that during the course of time, the Bible says, Cain brought his offering. And when he brought his offering to it, it was in stark contrast to what his brother Abel did. So here we have Cain that kind of gradually got to giving the offering. But Abel, it says, he brought the first fruits of his flock and he brought the first fruits in the Bible teaches and the Lord looked on favor with Abel and his offering. But he didn't look on favor with Cain's offering. Why? Because Cain's offering was not the first fruits. So of course, what happened next was that Cain was jealous of his brother and actually killed his brother over this jealousy of finance. So we can see how deep this goes. This principle of first fruits that was introduced in Genesis that I just talked about in Proverbs was in the Mosaic covenant of Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 2. Deuteronomy 26, verse 2, where it says, Take the first fruits of all that you produce, and this word some literally means the first, the very first, the very first harvest, the very first produce, the very first income stream, and bring that in. To the house of the Lord and put it in a basket. So if I put this in a, in a basket, I'm putting this element in and I'm keeping the rest. Now, 
It's so important we understand what that first is. But let me just give you some more Bible so you get this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. You can go ahead and turn to it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. But each in turn, and this is the, this is the point, Jesus Christ is the first fruits. Did you see that connection? Okay, we've just gone from Old Testament. We've just laid this principle down, and we made the leap to Jesus Christ being the first fruits. And then finally, Romans chapter eleven sixteen. Romans chapter eleven sixteen 16 says this. If the part of the dough offered is the first fruits, the first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. So in other words, you bring this into the kingdom first, and then the whole batch is made sanctified. Woo! The revelation of God's word is ridiculous. So clear. And yet there's so much confusion about this because the truth is you really have to trust God to bring your tithe in. But guess what? That's no different than the first day when we trusted God with our salvation. It's no different than that. It's no different than the first time we jumped into the water baptism tank and we trusted God for our future. It's no different. It's no different than trusting God to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's no different. It's all Bible. It's all the Word of God. And yet this, this challenges the very thinking of so many people. And that's why we just got to get back to basics. Find out what the Bible says. If you're disagreeing with me right now, then use the Bible as your principle to come to me with what you're thinking. And we will help you the best that we can. Because we're not out to argue. We're not out to offend people. We just want people to understand how great the Word of God is. The life-transforming principle of first fruits to get that health. Remember how it started. So that marriages can be saved from the peace of God making their entire life holy. I mean, that's so good. So that everything you do for the Lord can be sanctified and holy. Okay. You know, let me show this to you another way because it'll even make it more clear. And Callum, if you could come up and help me, that would be great. I've got my helper. He's running to the platform right now. Callum, let me show you another way. Because these days, of course, we don't use bread for currency. We use money. But money used to be called bread. Anybody old enough to remember that? Give me some bread. Dad, I need some bread. I remember saying, Dad, I need some bread. I don't mean that. I mean, Dad, give me some money. I need some money. Money is a relatively new invention. It was, invent it was probably invented, they say, 5,000 B.C. Until that time, we used land, possessions, cattle, all that stuff. But money makes things so much more easier. So here I've got currency that's represented in the U.K. by the Queen's likeness. Here we have 10 10-pound 10 notes we have 100 pounds. Now, what God says is we need to take the first. So if this is the first tenor I earned, that's the first hour I worked, then, and if I'm saying, well, God, I bring my tithe into the house, but I might, bring, I might bring that as my tithe. In other words, I might pay other bills first. I might pay other things first, and finally I'll get around to paying you. That, that's not what tithing means. First fruits means the first tithe, the first tenor, so the first tenor, you're going to be God for me, all right? The first tenor, I'm giving to God. That's the first tenor. Now, I've still got 90 left. Now, this is up to me to decide what I do with this 90. I could waste it, squander it. I could invest it. I can do whatever I want with it. But when you start to understand what the tithe is, you start to understand that God's blessing has just made this 90 pounds it brings it into another level now. So now I have creativity. I have God's blessing. I have God's strength in me. I have God's ideas and his incentive and his energy on the rest of what this is. And I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit says to me, okay, son, I want you to give, give me all your money. I'm like, there you go. And when I give the money, I don't think, well, great, now I'm broke. Oh. What a mean God he is. Now I've got no money. No, what I, I, what I think is this. I've given him the money. I've given him 100 pounds. And now I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I have open hands. Where's my source coming from? 
Where's my harvest? Now I've got a harvest. I literally have sown 100 pounds. I know there's a harvest coming somewhere. And I expect it and I believe it. And so I might be out for dinner with my friends. And my friends say to me, Steve, I want, you to, I want to buy a meal for you. And you're like, no, you can't buy a meal for me. I have to pay for you. Yeah, but you just sold the money. And now you're reaping through your friendship. But you don't see your friendship as a source. Or somebody else says, you know what, you're really in my heart. I want to give you a car. Or I want to give you a, I want, I want to bless you with a thousand pound or a holiday gift. No, I can't receive that. I can't receive that. Yeah, no, no, no. You just brought your first fruits into the house of God. You don't have the right to not receive God's blessing. You got to lay it down and receive with humility. That's hard for some of you to receive. It's super hard to say, okay, God, you want to bless me. And then God blesses me. And it's like, it's super hard for you to see that that provision is coming from the hand of God. But it is. And that's why the Bible says God is ready to throw open the gates. He's ready to throw open his windows. He's ready to bring provision. But are you ready to receive it? And with that thought, now we're going to receive our weekly tithes and offerings. And I wanted to teach first. I'm going to go on to teach about offerings in just a minute. But I wanted to talk about tithing because... What I've done, thanks so much, Callum, thank you so much. You can keep the money, go and sit down. Um, what, I, what, what, I'm saying about, what I'm saying about this, what I'm saying about this now is that the tithe is, is being brought into the local house. It's being brought into the storehouse. And when the tithe is brought into the storehouse, then the, the tithe being brought into the storehouse takes care of all the household needs. So this week, we've stepped out and we've done a few things. This week we have ordered new chairs for the church because we're stepping out of faith. I am done with these plastic yellow chairs. So the order is in. This week we're drawing up plans and we're beginning construction on the skate park, the long-awaited skate park. It's going up. It's going to happen in the next four to six weeks. It'll be finished. This week we're ordering the carpets for this site, taking care of all this worn-out carpet. That's what the tithe should do. Go back to Malachi chapter 3 because it says in verse 8, it's not just tithes, but tithes and offerings. Oh my gosh, I've had these conversations. And Christians say to me, some of my friends over the years, Steve, you've got to be joking. God just doesn't want my tithe. Now he wants my offering too. And you're like, oh, here we go. Like, yeah. He just doesn't want your offering. Newsflash. And this is where I help people find freedom. I say, Jesus wants your whole life. He's already dealt with your sin. Now what about your guilt? Now what about your fear? Now what about your lack of trust? He wants everything. Because then when you give God everything, guess what? That means you have everything Jesus has. You have everything that he has. You have his peace, not your fear. You have his provision, not your job. Woo! Come on, that's a whole nother level. When you have your father's provision, your father behind the scenes, I mean, that's what offering is starting to do for you. And you bring this aspect so that your entire life becomes holy. That is so exciting for the entrepreneurs in the house who are launching out a new business or a new book or a new ministry or a new thing that you think, oh my gosh, Jesus, if you don't come through, I am sunk. Here's the great thing is, Jesus will never let you down. He will never let your foot slip. He's already died for you. He's resurrected. He'll bring you through. You don't have to fear, but you have to put your praise on it. Because what's the offering? Your offering is your praise on top of what you've already given. You see, we're talking about being over and above. And I know this is difficult to talk about when you're an American. Hello, gosh darn it. I wish I could change my nationality right now. When you're an American living in a Yorkshire culture, I hear all these things, and I get all that, and that's why I'm just trying to go to the Word of God like I did my best and just brought those five scriptures. You see, in the Jewish culture, there was actually a festival. There are seven Jewish festivals. One of the festivals was called the First Fruits Festival. We've lost that, that culture today, but, but literally people would bring in their crops, and they would bring it into the house of God, and people would pray over their businesses. They would pray blessing and health and increase and initiative. Wow, what a great 
tradition in the Jewish culture. Boy, those Jews, they got some things figured out. I know they missed Jesus, but they understood the finance part. And if you look in any culture today, the Jewish culture, whatever oppression they've been through, they just bounce back and go right to the top. They just do. And all the banking industry, the financial industry, because they don't have a fear of finance. And I'm bringing that to break the curse of poverty, where people say it's good to be broke. It's good to be poor, because then you'll stay humble. No, it's not good to not be able to pay for food for your children. It's not good to lose the house that you invested your whole life in. It's not good to see people come up bailiffs from the court and carry away your things and your possessions that you've earned. It's not good. If that's ever happened to you, it's awful when you see that happen. And I've lived through some of that in my family. It's not a blessing. So don't tell me that poverty is a blessing. Don't tell me that poverty is a blessing when for just a few pounds, we could give someone the medication that could heal them and let the disease be free and have the whole life ahead of them. And yet people don't have the money. It's like, no, poverty is not a blessing. Money is a blessing because money feeds the poor. Money helps people get delivered from drug and alcohol addiction because it pays for counselors to be able to deliver them. Money helps buy buildings like this so we can see more and more people come outside of the elements and hear the Word of God being preached, which you can't hear in many nations of the world today. I mean, finance does so much. And as a church, we target once a year an annual offering to be able to designate funds, not just for need, tithes should take care of the local needs of the house, but to do so much more through our offering. Early on in Charlotte and I, we, we, we started to lead the church in 2012. And as we started to lead the church, there were so many needs. We had to use our vision offering to be able to meet some of those needs. But thank God, thank God that we're, we're at the end of that season and now we can talk about vision. And so we articulated the vision last week at Soul Night, but we wanted to bring just an aspect of this because every year we're gonna give to the offering, our vision offering to the house of God here at Life Church on our four campuses, Bradford, Leeds, Belfast, and Warsaw. And so we wanted to just clarify what it is we're giving to. What we're giving to is this. We've had 929 decisions for Jesus across our campuses this last year, but we wanna see that increased in the next year to come. We wanna see God do even more than that. We've seen 219 people baptized at Life Church over this last year. I mean, come on, is that the best thing you can do, church? That's amazing. That's amazing, 929 salvations. The angels in heaven are rejoicing right now over one. And we bring 929 salvations, 219 baptisms. And this church says, I've heard people say this, oh, Life Church, it's just about the hype. We're about, we're about lives changed. We're about rescuing people from hell. That's what we're about. People say, why do you need a Life City campus to reach university students? Why? Because we refuse to let immorality and all of the diseases that go along with it infect a young generation and rob their faith before they even get engaged to make a difference. So we built Life City to reach Bradford University campus and Bradford College. We wanna see more and more YAs get reached for Jesus. We refuse to see marriages broken. We refuse to see households destroyed. No, we're standing firm and we're saying this, you and your household can be saved. You can be growing in the house of God. You can be thriving in the house of God. No, you can do it because of what Jesus has already done for you. And so we're articulating that passion in this way, that passion like this, to help as many people as possible to believe in Jesus find belonging in God's house, and become all that they can be. Isn't that beautiful? So good. If we can reach people for Jesus, what are we giving to? We're giving to that. And until the return of Jesus, by His grace, let Life Church never be finished. 
Let it never be completely finished until the return of Jesus. Let there always be greater imagination. Let there always be new ministries that God wants to start amongst us. May there always be new young preachers and new young ministries emerging. May there always be new entrepreneurs taking a fresh risk for the kingdom of God so that they can become all that God has destined them to be. Let our church have this wonder and this awe and this imagination of becoming. I love that phrase. You see, we focus so much on the past. Well, what if we forget the past and we focus on what we're becoming, what we will be? That's the mission of our house. Believe, belong, and become. Everybody say that. Believe. Where can you believe more? Belong. Where can you connect more people to belong? Where can you become more? Oh my gosh, this is going to change your neighborhoods. This is going to change your relationships when you understand this. And then we'll articulate this even more. The vision of our house. And we have five statements at the moment. And on your seats, you can take them home with you. We have these for you. So you can put these on your refrigerators. And you can remember them and move forward. That's what our offering does. It does this. It moves the vision. People say, oh, yeah, we want to do so much more. Sure, guess what? We're going to start a second morning service on the Bradford campus. We're going to do that on the 3rd of September. We are. And we're going to reinvent our current Sunday evening 5 o'clock service. But we've got a great plan over the summer. It's going to be our best 5 o'clock services that we've ever had over these next few months ahead. And then come in the autumn, we want to see our YAs take much more of a lead in the reinvention of that process. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about that and praying about that and working with our leaders about that over the summer. But we have time because our vision is to become. And we've got a whole lot of young people in our house that have got to keep becoming. Well, what about the older people in our house, like me? Yeah. I turned 52 this week. Oh, my Lord Jesus. 52. It's great to be 52 because you have all the wisdom of all the things that you did wrong over the past 51 years. It's awesome. So now we have this. And I'm like, I'm not stopping for a younger generation. I feel like I'm 30. I feel like I got more energy, more strength, more vibrancy. I'm like, y'all got to get running because you're never going to catch me. I even did it yesterday practically. Me and Matthew Walker, who just turned 50. Come on, somebody. We decided to take some young lads on at football, and we destroyed them. We humiliated them. We just left them. We actually, we only beat them by one point. But you know what? Hallelujah. We did, it, was, we, it was a massive defeat, wasn't it, Matthew, on the pitch that day? You know, that's a little funny thing, but the truth is, guys, we need everybody to realize we're still becoming. You might be in your 80s. You might be in your 90s. You're still becoming. Here's the great news. Your greatest days are ahead. They are. So, oh, how can you say that? How can you say that? Listen, we're going to be in heaven. It's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be incredible in heaven. But we're on the earth. we got work to do on the earth. we got stuff to do. we got vision to outwork. We got th That's what we're giving next week. Oh, there's lots more that we want to do. We want to introduce an evangelistic equipping course. We're not going to call it evangelistic equipping because that's not evangelist. No, we're not. We're going to call it helping people to bring the good news. Probably shorten it down and we're going to reinvent that. Why? Because we know how to do those things. We've launched Growth Track. This year, in this next year, 2017, we will see over a thousand people have gone through Growth Track in this next season of our church. We're going to see that happen. But now we're going to introduce a Go Track. And with our Go Track, we're going to help this concept land. So there's so much more that we want to do. And in the future, we'll talk more about it. But it's all about this principle. First, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be added. We should really only need to say to the church, listen, this is our annual Vision Sunday. Here we go. Let's just all give. That's all we really need to say. But our heart as a leadership team is to be accountable, is to be clear. So we talk about where our money went. We talk about where it went. We just talked about that at Soul Night. And if you want to be a part of the incredible team that makes a difference at Live Church, please join a serving team. Be a part of the team. Come into our Soul Night where your heads go deeper into all the different things of the church. Be a part of that. Why? Because we really believe the greatest idea that God ever had 
is people. We're in, the, we're in the people work. We're not even in the people business. We're in people work every day, all day. People don't drain us. People are the very reason this church exists, to bring life to the broken, help to the hurting, to help people discover the fact they have a great future. That's what our giving does. And so underneath your seats, you're gonna find an envelope. And in an envelope there, it's, it's our vision envelope. And you can go ahead and grab it and you can put it in your notebook and, and, and put it in your Bibles or put it in your purse and do whatever you want with that. And, and we're gonna just, in fact, let's do this. Let's pray over all of these giving things in just a moment. That'd be even better. So just hold it in your hand and I want you to look at it. And I want you to begin to pray and think about what the Lord is asking you as a family, you as a couple, you as an individual, you as a person to give. Every single person. Maybe you're married. Well, husband and wife, you're still people, individual people. Both of you decide what to give. You know, each person should decide what to give in their heart. And, and as you're thinking about that, I just want to tell you a story about a man called James. James lived in the 1900s. He was born at the back end of the 19th century and in 1903, he began to work his first job ever. Worked for a very small company in New York. Things didn't go very well for James and he lost his job. So he decided to take the little bit of savings he had left and he bought a wagon and he bought a horse. He named his horse Patty. Patty is a good name for a horse, isn't it? He said to Patty one day, because his sales weren't going very well, no one would buy the things that he made. He said, Patty, things aren't going good. If we don't do something drastic, we're just gonna end up starving to death. So James, who had been raised in a local church, he decided that he would try tithing and offering. And he made a decision that day, just him out alone with his horse. And he prayed and he said, Jesus, if you help me, I'll dedicate not just 10%, but 25% of everything I earn for the rest of my life. And I'll bring that into your house and I'll build the local church with it. 25%, I promise, Lord. But you gotta help me because I've got literally no money left. I don't have a penny, don't have a thing. James, in his brokenness and in his poverty, made the best decision of his life. From that moment, things began to change. James went on to employ his four brothers who began to work for him. And that year, 1906, he had an idea. He invented how to process cheese. With the first invention, he patented it. His products began to sell. Then he had another idea for the next product. He had another idea for the next product after that. He went on to invent single sliced cheese, macaroni and cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese, just to name a few of the products he invented. You see, this man, James, <laughs> said this, the only investment I ever made was to invest the money that I had to the Lord. And it was the greatest decision I ever made. I'm talking about James Kraft, who dedicated through his entire life 25% of his income and did so much good. You see, today you might be in a place where you don't have very much, but if you make a simple decision, God can do the rest. Amen, church? Hey, thanks so much. I am so glad we had this time together. We focused on some of the things that God is talking to us about here at Life Church. And now as we bring our time to a close, we pray that whatever you're dreaming for, whatever vision you have in your life, that that would be articulated as you move forward, that you know that your God is for you. And because God is for you, nobody can be against you. And if God can do this in Bradford and in England and in Europe, God can do great things in your life too. We really pray if you want to partner with us, if you just want to come visit one of our four campuses, we would love to see you there. And throughout this month ahead, we'll keep letting you know about what God is doing as we expect Him to do the miraculous over these next few weeks ahead. So come one and come all to the one who is over it all and through it all. It is time now to move as 
one, speak as one, and act as one. We who are many are never more powerful than when we are one. of college so far has been seeing how much my capacity is stretched. Like I know I came to college with this much to offer but God has managed to use me this much and I don't know what happened in the gap that God was in there and it's just blown me away. Yeah.